Hello, uh, David Marks here. A very special treat today. Today I'm with one of my oldest friends in photography, Forrest Chapman of the Rocky Mountain School of Photography in Missoula, Montana. And today, for a special treat, we're going to cover 10 hidden features of Lightroom. He'll do five, I'll do five. Okay, so I have five tips here, but all of them are going to involve the same button on the keyboard. For some reason, the Adobe engineers love the Alt key. That's Alt on a PC, Alt option on a Mac. And all through Lightroom, as you'll see, the Alt key opens hidden features, secrets that you wouldn't discover on your own. Now, most folks know typing an email, typing a letter, you hold down the Shift key, it turns a lowercase letter into a capital letter. Well, the Alt key does all these other amazing things here in Lightroom. So, for example, let's say that I go looking for, like, photos from a wedding. Right? So, if you've used Lightroom Classic, you probably know that one of the most efficient ways to organize your photos is with keywords. For example, here's that keyword, say, wedding. And that's why these photos all popped up for me. But let's face it, typing keywords in, right, this click here to add keywords, that's inefficient, it's tedious, and for the most part, over time, we get tired of typing, especially the same word again and again. So, like, let's say you go and photograph a friend's wedding, and you have thousands of photos that you shot, and now you want to keyword them. Well, one way to speed that up are these recent keyword buttons. If you were to click one of these buttons, this doesn't make any sense, but I'll click, say, black and white conversion, that writes the keyword in for you. You can see it up here in the big box. And when I click that button again, the keyword disappears. And you could go even faster if you find that in the keyword set area, there are these other sets of keywords, meaning other buttons, that Adobe has designed for us. Like, these nine were nine little samples that Adobe thought a wedding photographer might use all the time. Now, I do encourage you to make your own keyword sets. Uh, for example, I have ones for, like, members of my immediate family, so I don't have to type out family members' names again and again and again. But for now, we'll stick with the wedding keywords. So let's say you have all these photos from a friend's wedding, and on all the ones with the bride, obviously, the keyword bride is what we're going to need to find that photo years down the road. Well, yes, I could click the button bride, click on the next photo, click the button bride. But really, I should be clicking bride, groom, pre-ceremony, etc. Well, check this out. If you hold down that Alt, Alt on a PC, Alt Option key on a Mac, you'll see that some light gray little numbers appear next to those buttons. And with the Alt key held down, now all you have to do is press that number on your keyboard, and Lightroom will write in that word for you. So, for example, I can put in groom here. I can put in, say, ceremony, all without having to move the mouse or use, especially on the laptop, basically I can use one hand for all of this. This gets even faster if we, say, select a bunch of photos. Because, of course, in Lightroom, when you have more than one file selected, whatever you do to one is happening to all of them. So, like that, I could pick a whole bunch of these photos and go Alt, Alt, 7 for bride, 8 for groom, and we'll just say two for ceremony. I've added three keywords to three photos using nothing but one hand. Piece of cake. Wow, I never knew that. Look at that. Awesome. Love it. For my first tip, we're going to look at a little setting when you're doing any sort of spot removal in Lightroom, which helps you see the spots. So when we're in a photo like this, obviously this image is horribly messy and horribly noisy and all of these things. If we take it into the develop module and we grab the spot removal tool, obviously it's pretty easy to see our spots and nab them and get them out of here pretty quickly and easily. But on some images such as, let me hop back here and grab this one, the spots are not nearly as easy to see. Like obviously we can zoom in and kind of look around here and see, oh, there are some here, but it's not gonna be as apparent because those spots are not as crisp. And normally if you use a less stopped down aperture, your spots will not be as crispy as they would be at like F22 or F32 or something like that. So what we can do here is grab the spot removal tool and down here on the toolbar at the bottom, and you may need to hit the letter T to bring up your toolbar. Sometimes it hides itself. Oh, that's a secret worth learning. Super annoying. Uh, T will bring that back. We have a little checkbox that says visualize spots. We can turn this on and it takes you into this little weird kind of black and white view. And we can use this slider to customize kind of the level of, I don't know what you'd say, the, the level of masking that's applied to this to show you those spots. And we can see now all of those little spots stick out so we can zap them really quickly and easily. Now, I would 
kind of war warn people from uh, doing this without, as you can see, weird things start happening. I wouldn't start actually cloning away spots without turning off visualized spots. Use that as a way to find them initially, kind of see where they are, do some cleaning up without it turned on. And then when you're all done, I would always turn visualized spots on at the very end, just to ensure that you really did get every spot off of the image. So again, pretty easy. You can go ahead and just turn that on by checking the checkbox. You can also hit the letter A on the keyboard via the keyboard shortcut. We like those, makes things faster. So visualize spots would be my first tip, super quick and easy. Awesome. Uh, so to pick up on my next tip, so here in the library module, again, I'm going I'm to stick with the wedding photos for just a second, because let's face it, anytime you go to an event like this, you're going to shoot way more photos than you actually need. And there's nothing less efficient in Lightroom than having to go from the library to the develop module to fine tune one image, moving all these sliders back to the library, on to the next photo, back to develop. If we're working fast, if this is something where roughly good enough is good enough for the job, then the quick develop panel in the library module is a great way to save yourself a lot of time. With quick develop, what we're doing is calling those features that we know and love from the full develop module, but we don't have to move from place to place. So for example, in here, if I wanted just for demo to make this one darker, I can just tap these little exposure buttons, and what I've really done in develop is move the exposure slider down by like negative one stop. So back here in the library though, let me go back to library, and just for the doing, let me just reset the develop settings on this one. Here in the library, if you open this little disclosure triangle, you'll find there are plenty of sliders to use to fine tune an image, exposure, contrast, highlight shadows, whites, whatever. So in here, I could say, well, I think I want the highlights a little darker, I want the shadows a little lighter, I want a little less contrast, maybe I want a little more clarity, a little more vibrant. But some of the controls that we're used to using in develop are missing. Well, the secret here is, again, that Alt key. It won't give us everything, but if I hold Alt, Alt Option, you'll notice at the bottom that sharpening, uh, or that clarity and vibrance become sharpening and saturation. So in this photo, if I wanted to, I could add a little bit of sharpening. Now, obviously, I should be in there at 100%, at one-to-one, -one, to really see if this is doing good work or bad work. Likewise, if I wanted, I could change vibrance to saturation, and just to show, I could boost that way, way up, like way too far. Or, with the Alt key held down, I could go the opposite and drop all the saturation out, so now I have a black and white, and I haven't had to leave the library module to get there. And of course, like my last trick, you can select a block of files, still use the Alt key, and like that I could make any of these sharper or less saturated, and these two would never be visible to you without that keyboard modifier. It's so good. Why don't they just make it a little bit longer? <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer the why. Tell me why, Dave. I can't tell you why they, they love this button. Find out. Um, all right, awesome. Let's see. Grab a good folder here. My next tip is a little bit more in the preference side of things, and it has to do with what happens to your changes that you make to your images when you make them. So by default, whenever you make a change to an image, that change is written down into the catalog, into little Lightroom's little catalog file. And that's great because that allows us to have non-destructive editing. It allows the original image to remain unchanged on the hard drive and all of those good things. The problem is, by default, those changes are only written down to the catalog file itself, which means if you were to delete your catalog or something happened to it and it got corrupted, all of those edits that you've made to your images would be lost. The image would be fine on its own, but it wouldn't have any of those changes. So one preference that I really like to change is up here under Edit Preferences. Mac folks, it would be Lightroom Preferences. We go into Preferences, and you can actually go through Preferences, or you can go right to it. I'm actually going to go to Edit Catalog Settings, so Lightroom Catalog Settings. Inside of the Catalog Settings panel, there is a tab for Metadata. And the third option down here says Automatically Write Changes into XMP. So what that means is when you make a change in Lightroom, if you enable this checkbox, instead of that change only being written down to the catalog, a second copy, so to speak, is also written down to the metadata of the file itself. 
Now it's still non-destructive. You're still not going to permanently alter your image. You're still not doing anything to that original file. But if your catalog got corrupted or your catalog got deleted, you kind of have a fallback. You have a way to get some of those changes, actually all of those changes back. Missing a few things, you won't get your history back. You won't get a few things like that. But worst case scenario, if that were to happen and your catalog went away, you've got a little bit of a backup. So I really recommend this. This is actually the first thing I will do anytime I make a new catalog is before I do any editing, turn that checkbox on and then I know that I'm good to go for future uh, edits that I make to my images. That is such a helpful tip. It, yeah, it's forgotten. Again, why, why isn't that default? <laughs> why could be the theme of this whole day? Okay, so this, this next tip is going to be really quick and easy. Um, one of my favorite features as a landscape and travel photographer is the map module in Lightroom Classic. It gets no press, it gets no publicity, but I think it's one of the most useful organizing tools in the whole program. So, I'm going to hop over to the map, and I have to explain here that the map in Lightroom is really this company. It's Google's map. Lightroom is just using the map to their advantage. Now, I can go to a place on the map by just typing in this search box. So I'll say like Grand Canyon, oops, spelling counts, um, National Park, and the map will fly me roughly there, right? And of course, we can change the style of the map. You can have satellite mapping and road mapping and, and uh, what they call the hybrid map, which is kind of a cross between the road and all. But what's really frustrating to me is zooming in on the map. Now, there is obviously a zoom slider right down here, and I can click this little plus, and it zooms in. And yes, I can zoom in up here in the navigator window as well, but it used to be that you could like use the scroll wheel on your mouse to zoom in and out. That seems to have gone away. And with the trackpad like on my laptop, that just moved me around the map. It doesn't zoom me in and out. So here's the trick. If you want to zoom in on a particular part of the map, hold down that Alt key again. So Alt, Alt Option. And then you can drag out a little rectangle. Where you place the rectangle is where it zooms in. So you can tell it I want to zoom in here and here and here. So for example, for these, let me just zoom, we'll just say right here. Let's say that these three photos belong there on this map. I drag, I drop, that places them. It was way easier for me to find exactly where I wanted these photos to go, thanks to that alt trick again. So many things I don't know. The map module, I never use it. Oh, it's my favorite. I should. If my camera had GPS, I would. But, but, like, but none of my cameras have GPS. I know, you just add it manually. Uh, well, that or I have one of those Garmin, oh. uh, I have one of those little GPS mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. yep. and you just sync the track log when you get home, yep. and in no time, all of your photos are where they should That's be. That's pretty cool. I should try that. You can do it with your cell phone. Yeah. You can add a free tracking app on your phone. Turn it on yeah. when you leave the car, turn it off when you get back, and your photos placed sweet. where they should be. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, because I always like my iPhone catalog, I have it. I use the map module sometimes, but that's about it. Yeah. Cool. Um, what am I doing next? It is, oh, yeah, a few options. Um, okay. My next tip is more of a kind of preference in Lightroom, again, just like the last one, where I want to show you how to customize your view in Lightroom. A lot of people just use the default view that is presented to them when they first open the program. And there's actually a lot of ways to customize both the grid view and also the loop view when you're coming in close on an image. So in order to do this, I'm going to go back to my grid view here, and I'm going to go up to View and View Options. And the View Options panel is broken up into two uh, tabs, you could say, one for grid view and one for loop view. The grid view tab is obviously where we do all of our customization of the grid area. And there's two ways that we can, we can kind of set this up. One is with expanded cells and the other is what are called compact cells. And luckily you can see all of this stuff in real time. Compact cells, each image takes up a little bit less space on your grid, so you can fit more images in the same amount of space. Expanded cells gives you more information about those images. I personally like expanded cells. I like getting a little bit more info there. Beyond that, we can go ahead and talk about different items that are clickable on these things. There's these clickable items on mouse over only. I like to leave that off so you can always see what's clickable. Invisible buttons are kind of silly in that my opinion. That one drives me nuts. It really does. Um, tint cells with label colors, I like to leave that on. Again, a lot of this stuff is default. Tool tips are always good in my opinion, so I might turn that in. Although image info tool tips, I don't know. 
you can choose your own adventure on that one. What do you do with image info tool tips? I think they're really helpful when you're learning. They drive me nuts when I'm recording video tutorials because no sooner do you park the mouse somewhere to explain something than this whole dialog box pops up. <laughs> That's exactly what you're telling the people. Excellent. I'm going to leave mine off in that case. <laughs> uh, we also have cell icons, which are the little icons that signify doing different things. These little badges are the lower right-hand corner on each image. I actually don't like those. I don't know why I have mine on right now. Um, not personally my thing. The big thing, though, that I want to talk about is the compact cell extras and the expanded cell extras. So depending on which type of cells you picked up above, you can choose which extras there are alongside of those different cells. So for me, since I'm on expanded cells, I'm going to be in the expanded cell extras section. And you can customize all of these different things that are basically extra bits of information that get laid on top of those images. So what I would recommend for you guys is click through this list. You can see it's crazy long, all of the things that you can overlay here and find some things that are useful. For me, I like things like exposure, what camera I used, how many megapixels that camera was, what the file name is, just different things to compare between my different images. But again, it's super customizable. It's definitely worth diving in here. You'll notice, though, that compact cell extras, you're much more limited. Instead of four customizable areas, you only have two. So you can kind of pick and choose there. Also, in loop view, there are some other areas we can customize. There's this loop view info section. And I'll go ahead and turn that on right here. The keyboard shortcut for that is the letter I. If you're not inside of the view options, I toggles this upper left bit of information on and off. And in here, you can choose what info it tells you. So again, camera you used, lens you used, different things like that. Basically, I just really urge you guys to dive in here and take a look at what the different options are and at least take five minutes to set this up because especially in the expanded, the loop view for me, being able to quickly hit the letter I and see really useful information on my images saves so much time, especially if you're just like wanting to see how your shutter speed changed or something's not quite sharp and you want to know why. It might make sense to just hit I, say, oh, I used 1 25th of a second on that and I didn't have a tripod. Probably wasn't uh, too great of an idea. So definitely go in there, give that a little customization time, and I think it'll help you out. How can you not like the badges? You don't like that. You like badges? They tell you what you've done. I hate badges. They tell you what oh. work you haven't done oh, to an image. That's they're, so annoying. They're the best way to tell an image that hasn't been worked on from one that has it's been true. worked on without leaving the grid. It's true. What well, don't you like? You don't like, there's something that you always used to say, we don't need no, wasn't it badges? We oh, don't the need badges no I like. Badges. I don't like the uh, quick develop marker. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, the quick, the sorry, quick the quick collection marker. <laughs> quick collection I never marker. understood the point of the quick collection. The quick collection is super stupid. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> like if I'm going to put it in a collection, mm -hmm. I'll put it in a collection that has a meaningful name. And yep. if I'm not going to put it in a collection, what is this little dot doing on mm -hmm. my image? Yep, and then you click the little dot accidentally. And, now and then you no end up somewhere else. Collection. Yeah, like I never understood the quick collection idea. Okay, so I'm on this theme of things the alt key can do. And the next place that we'll find an alt key secret is in the develop module. Now in here, the alt key can be used all over the place. And if, if you haven't tried it, my advice is as you work your way through the many sliders in Lightroom Classic in the develop module, hold down alt, alt option and click and drag on the slider. So that's the key difference here is with the alt key depressed, nothing's going to happen until you start dragging. But like for example, in the basic panel, at the top, when I hold the Alt, Alt Option key and click on Exposure, the screen goes all black. And if I slide this up, that's the area that will become paper white. They call that the clipping indicators. It's the same thing that we see here at the top of the histogram, only I don't have to mouse away from Exposure to know that I've blown out the sky. So with the Alt key held down, I could go the other way. When it's black, that's no problem. That's on this slider. That means I haven't blown anything out. And the same down here, like for the highlights, for the shadows, for the whites, and for the blacks. Now, most folks, I bet, either knew that or you could turn on the clipping indicators and find the same thing out. But as we get down further into the features of the develop module, there are some where without this alt trick, they're really hard to use. One example would be split toning. Now, for this to make sense, usually when we add a tone, we'll be working with a black and white image. And split toning, is how we would say give it like a sepia tone or a selenium tone. But the thing is, you can drag these sliders, these toning sliders back and forth all day. They don't do anything on their own until you've added some saturation, right? Because when the strength, that's what saturation really means here, of the hue, 
the tone you pick is zero, well, something at zero strength has zero effect. So I find it kind of frustrating to have to like pick the color I want and then drag this guy up and down to see if that is indeed the color I want. So the alt click trick again. If you hold the alt key and click on hue, it goes ahead and simulates what this would look like at a medium strength for you. Makes it way easier to say, well, I want like a warm brown tone for my highlights and I want like a cool blue tone for my shadows and now I can set these up to the level that I think looks good on this image. Now I'm going to reset this just a second here, but I really think if you're going to mess with split toning, you got to know this hidden, undocumented, why is it invisible, I don't know, alt click trick. The other place where this is just so helpful, and let me just go back in history here just a second. Let me go back to say when it was in color. There we go. The other place where the alt trick is just downright essential is in the sharpening part of Lightroom. In the detail panel, I think you really can't work these four sliders well unless you know this trick. And in particular, the one that says masking. And, and as Forrest showed just a minute ago with the, uh, the hidden dust spots feature, with the, with the visualized dust spots, if you hold the alt key and click on masking, an all white mask here means that this is sharpening the entire photo. Well, there's no reason to sharpen all these pixels in a flat yellow, blue, gray sky. There, there's no detail to be gained there. So what I can do is hold Alt Option and drag that masking slider up. Now this is a bit of Photoshop vocabulary, but in the language of Photoshop, black blocks a change and white reveals the change. The black masks it off and the white allows it to shine through. The only way in Lightroom to see the sharpening mask is with that Alt key depressed. If you don't know that trick, you really can't use this slider without just wildly guessing. That's one of the most important sliders in sharpening. I think it's critical. <laughs> I agree. No, that's like one of the main places I use the Alt key. It's perfect. Um, all right. For my next feature, I want to talk a little bit about local adjustments and specifically when you're using the local adjustment brush, a way to be a little bit more accurate with your painting. And the example I want to use is this photo here. If I was trying to make a mask or make a local adjustment on the sky here, let's say that I wanted to darken the sky. What I could do was just, first of all, do the normal way that most people know of, which is just to kind of paint. And I can hit the letter O if I want to turn on my overlay to see where I've painted. And this is all fine and dandy for the background, where the transition between the sky and the background is kind of fuzzy and soft. I can use a very high feathered or low hardness, if you want to talk Photoshop terms, brush. And it works great. I can paint around here. The problem comes in when I start wanting to paint around the camera and around Sarah here. So I could zoom in and I could get a really small brush and try to paint very accurately. And that is one way to do it. But the other way that I can do it, let me move up my cursor here a little bit. The other way that I can do it is I can actually turn on this thing called auto masking inside of the local adjustment brush panel. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. And what this is going to do, let me make my brush nice and big here. And I'm actually going to make it very low feather, very hard edged brush. So first of all, with auto masking off, if I was to be painting here, and I'm going to have the overlay on so you can see, and I started to run up into the camera it's not gonna stop or hesitate or really do anything to try to prevent me from painting the camera as well. To the contrary, if I turn on auto masking and I do the same painting, and you can see that the reaction is the same over the sky. As I start to get down to the camera though, the auto masking actually prevents me from painting the camera. It's seeing that there's so much difference in what my paintbrush is touching between what I'm trying to paint and what I'm not, that it's not painting that area. And the way this works is the little plus sign in the center of this circular brush. Lightroom is looking at what's under that plus sign. And if that plus sign doesn't touch anything that you don't want, it's not going to paint it. But watch what happens. If I run down and that plus sign just touches the camera, then it says, oh, that must be OK to paint that tonality. And so it paints the camera area. Now, obviously, this is going to be a little bit of a mixed bag for working in all situations. You need a little bit of contrast between what you want and what you don't want. But in a situation like this where there's plenty of contrast, Lightroom's going to have no problem seeing these edges. And you can see the hat there. The blue is very similar to the sky blue. But it's going to help you. It's going to give you a big kind of advantage in how you're doing it. Now, the opposite is true. Let me quickly delete this. 
If I was trying to paint the hat here, paint Sarah's hat, I would want to turn auto masking off because with it on, we're going to have to scrub over a lot of these areas a lot of times to fill in all the little bits. Whereas if we turned off auto masking, let me go ahead and undo that, then we only have to go over everything one time and it fills all those areas in. So I would say if you're trying to fill in a big area with a lot of texture in it and you want to paint all of it, turn off auto masking. Just let it fill paint and just be careful with your painting. But if you're painting up against an edge, turn on auto masking, be real careful not to let that plus sign touch and it'll help you stay inside the lines. Cool. There we are. Tangent. Go for it. Since Lightroom and Photoshop are now bundled and you can't buy one without the other, I have wondered why they include the brush tool in here oh, at all. Me too. And why that isn't just a take me to Photoshop button. I know. It really, like, there's so many things now that you get Photoshop for free. So right. You should like, Photoshop. Like, <laughs> it, it's actually, if you want to use the brush, yeah. they have included the best brushing program yeah. ever. Photoshop. <laughs> and, it, like, it didn't yeah. cost you anything more than Lightroom. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I think more and more people need to learn Photoshop because it's, it's a great program and it does this stuff better. Um, Yes, t t tangent, tangent, <laughs> tangent. Yeah, do your thing, uh, do your thing. All right, my next trick of the Alt key is slightly more involved. The thing is, there's a module in Lightroom that I would really like to use, but I find it very limited, and that's the slideshow module. So if I'm going to put together a slideshow, the way it works in Lightroom is you build a collection first. Like I have this one here I'm just calling AA Temp. I'm going to right-click on it, and set it as the target collection. Now, I didn't list that as a bonus hidden feature, but it might as well be. Call it my, my bonus uh, trick for you. So now, when it has that little tiny plus, when it's the target, if there's an image I want to add to the collection, all I have to do on the keyboard is press the letter B. B for bring it into the target collection, or B for bring it out. So I can go and press the letter B, and now this one, is in that collection. And the reason you have to put your photos into a collection first is because if you go to the slideshow, like for me, if I go all photos, slideshow, well, I have 131,000 photos. And Lightroom would then assume that I want to see all 131,000. And although I like my photography, it's not 131,000 photos worth sitting through in a slideshow. So you got to gather up the winners uh, before you make the design, that's what the slideshow module really does. Well, anyway, I'm just going to grab just a couple of random photos here. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to say B and B and B and B. Fine. So now I have four photos. Let's just say it's going to be a very short slideshow. So I go to the slideshow module. Now, the slideshow module is great for things like this gray border or my website's little logo down there in the bottom corner. Let's say I want that one like in the opposite corner. The slideshow module is great for what we're really doing in here is this, uh, like that little border around the edge. We're designing the look that goes in the slideshow. This is fine if you want to play it here in Lightroom. But when you want the slideshow to have more features than this, when you want like different transitions between one slide and another, or if you want a different length for one slide than the next, Lightroom actually won't give that to you. The controls down here in the playback part have not been updated in a painfully long time. And compared to, say, Keynote, the slideshow presentation maker on the Mac, or PowerPoint on the PC, what we have here is pretty feeble, right? The same transition on every single slide. So what I'd love to do is design something like this, my logo, the gray background, the border. But then I want to put these photos with their framing elements over into Keynote, since I'm on a Mac. Uh, PC folks, PowerPoint's the same, or some more sophisticated slideshow program. Well, the problem is down here, the only two buttons at the bottom where it says export, meaning save a copy, are save as a PDF or export as a video. Now, video is fine if you're posting to YouTube, but again, it doesn't fix the, the slide timing or the lack of the ability to set a different transition from this frame to that frame. Well, the secret here is if you hold the Alt key again, the one that says export to PDF becomes export to JPEG. So if I click on this one, Lightroom will say, what do you want me to call these? 
And I'm just going to put them on the desktop. I'm just going to call this demo slides. All right, I can tell it uh, what quality, what size. In this case, I'm going to go, go 2048 by 1536. So a big high quality uh, image. I hit export. Just like that, Lightroom will cook what you see here. Each one of these images with its gray background and my little logo, it'll cook them all as individual JPEGs. It will drop them into a folder on my desktop. Here they are, demo slides. You can see them one, two, three, see the framing. All that design work Lightroom did fine for me. So now all I have to do is go to whatever slideshow program I want, say Keynote or PowerPoint or whatever you're using, and I can just drop these slides into Keynote. I'll just drag all four of them. I'll drop them in. I'll delete this blank one at the top because I don't really need it. And now I can use all of the cool animation type effects. Let me zoom this out here so you can see that indeed what we did in Lightroom is still there. Let me go view, uh, zoom, fit to content. There we go. So I've still got my logo. Don't sweat this black background. I can fix that in here. You know, that's the color fill. But now I have all the animation ability of Keynote or PowerPoint and the design ability of Lightroom thanks to the alt key. That's awesome. Where'd you get the 2048 resolution? Uh, I just made up some numbers. Oh, all right, cool. It's <laughs> like, whoa, that's some new, well, new aspect I've never heard well, of. Well, by going that big, you'd have the ability to say zoom in and out yeah, totally. inside the Keynote. The Ken Burns. The Ken Burns effect, uh -huh, right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. right. I just made you up some do numbers. <laughs> Don't sweat those numbers. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, all right. For my last little hidden tip, I want to talk a little bit about deleting images. So this actually is kind of one of those first things that you would do. When you import off of a card, you potentially have you know, a few hundred images to go through. And normally, you're going to go through those in full screen view. You're going to be zoomed in, just looking at it in either with the F key with full screen, or you double click, get into loop view, however that happens to be. Well, the problem is when you're going through your images, if you find one you don't like and you want to delete, the traditional way is just to hit the delete key and every time say delete from disk again and again and again and again. And the problem is when you have four or 500 images to go through, that's hitting the key, mousing over, clicking, hitting the key, mousing over, clicking. It's not very fast. So what I recommend instead is to go through your images the same way, but each time you find one that you want to delete, instead of hitting the delete key, hit the letter X on the keyboard. And what X is going to do is it's going to give it the reject flag, the little black, it looks like a little black pirate flag. And so what I'll do is I'll go through all of my images and I'll X all of the ones that I'm looking to get rid of. So real quick, I could just go bam, 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 X the ones that I don't care about, so on and so forth. When I get all done, when I get to the end, I'll escape out of full screen view. And then with one quick little clicking, I can get to delete those. And the way you do this is you go up to photo and delete rejected photos. And what that tells the computer to do is any images with the X flag, it's going to delete. Now you need to be careful here because you accidentally hit X on some images, you might not notice. So what it does is once you click it, it actually shows you in the background the images that it's going to delete. And I usually recommend people kind of glance over that, make sure that you're not really deleting anything you don't mean to. And then it gives you this little are you sure button where we can say delete from disk. And we only have to do that once. As soon as we hit delete from disk, all of those rejected photos are deleted off the hard drive and sent away, which is really awesome. It can save a lot of time. Another way to do this is if you don't want to go up to photo, delete rejected photos, and you just want to see the images that you've rejected, you can also at the top of the grid view, go to the attribute section, and you can click the little black flag. And that will filter by rejected. It'll basically tell Lightroom, look through all of these images and find the ones that have the X flag. And you could just manually select those and hit the delete key and do essentially the same thing. So instead of deleting images one by one, instead use X, delete them all in a batch at the very end. Quick and time saving. That's, I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the uh, reject and delete as a block, as a batch, rather than the one by one. Yeah, way faster. This last one is probably pretty geeky. And it's, a, it's gonna make use of some features of Lightroom that most people don't use, although I think they should. The, Feature I'm interested in here are smart collections. And what smart collections do is they, they run like filters, if you will, in the background. They look for things like keywords or star ratings, and they look for them continuously. So for example, if I want to find all of my, say, five star rated photos in here, I can come up to the library attribute bar, 
and I could say, show me the three star or the green label or whatever. Now, in this case, you know, nothing's popping up, but don't sweat it. If I was in all photos and I went, say, five star, just like that, Lightroom's going to pick out, you know, 10 of my favorite images out of the 130,000. Well, that's doing this once. When you make a smart collection, you're telling it to do that all the time. So, for example, in here, if I say rating is greater than or equal to five star, that runs always in the background. So Lightroom is continually looking for any image that meets the rules to be in this club. And let me just show you down here, one of the things I use is I, I have this set of smart collections that do things like filter all the time for my one star images, two star, five star. They're always there. Well, that's pretty straightforward. But there are times when we want to make a smart collection that has a few more rules and possibly a conditional rule, a if or type sentence. A prime example would be for those of you who sell photos at like Microstock, at uh, Adobe Stock, iStock, you know that when you send in photos of people, you need a model release. When you send in photos of commercial property, you need a property release. So as I'm going through my photos, I will keyword things with words like portrait, right? Meaning if it's a person and I want to send this to stock, that I have to have a, a model release for it. Or I might keyword with like property, right? For, for things that I know have, you know, like this clearly recognizable commercial property. So let's say that I want to make a smart collection. So I'll go smart collection and we'll call this say easy stock submissions. All right. So what I'm going to say here is I want any photo whose rating is four stars or better. I'm going to say I want only photos whose ISO is lower than, uh, let's say, a thousand. Because on my camera above that, it gets noisy and they're likely to reject it. So why send them things? Why waste the time uploading files that probably won't get used, will get rejected, et cetera? Well, those two are pretty straightforward, right? I only want files with a four star rating at a relatively low ISO. Well, here's the last of the alt click trick tricks. If I hold down the alt key in here, instead of just adding one more rule, I can add a conditional rule. And here, I'm going to set this one to say none of the following are true. And I'm going to say that for stock, for my easy submissions, I want things where there is not the keyword portrait, meaning things where I might need a model release. And I don't want anything where the keyword has property. And this is the beauty of this trick is that I can use it to, oops, sorry, property, right? By using this, I can say any of the following, all of the following, or none of the following. So by setting this up, by breaking the normal rule, by holding that alt key to create a condition, I can get a collection that looks like this in no time. I don't know You said uh, ISO is a thousand. Oh, not don't. Less than. Oh, thank goodness somebody's paying attention here. <laughs> well, thank you, buddy. Yeah. Is less than a thousand. And that you said less than a hundred. Uh, ah, oh, this is, see, this is why we don't do these things live. <laughs> One thousand. So now it should populate a grid of images like this that all have three stars that do not have property releases, no portraits. These are the files that I can send into stock in no time without having to dig out all that extra paperwork. Whew. Let me just uh, go back in here and show you the rules, if you will, right? Rating is four stars or better. ISO is less than a thousand. And then the condition, none of the following are true. I didn't know that. That's really cool. I've well, made smart collections for so long and never knew how to do a conditional. That's so awesome. Didn't even know it was possible. It is possible. My goodness. Um, I'm glad I wasn't like, you know, someday telling the students, why doesn't Adobe put conditional statements in? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that one, I, I have to thank one of the Adobe engineers. Uh, one of Benjamin Ward's little videos is, is how I learned that. And yeah. I only learned it, I don't know, a couple of months or a year ago. Um, really cool. So for nine, ten years, I had no idea it was yeah, in there either. That's awesome. Really sweet. We're done. Outro time, I think. Uh, well, thank you so much. I hope that some of these tips were new to you. I, I learned some things today. It's absolutely a pleasure to, uh, to work with my old friend Forrest again. And uh, 
if you haven't heard me say this before, no one knows everything about Lightroom. This is a program that's way too complex and used in too many ways for one person to have all the secrets. Thanks, Forrest. You're welcome. That was really fun. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Hopefully, you learned something. I know I definitely did. I uh, learned a few things there, which is really awesome. The Alt key is just so powerful. Um, if you guys did like this video, I would love you to hit that like button. If you didn't like it, hit the dislike button. If you have a question, comment, concern, whatever it is, leave it in the comment section. And also, you guys should totally subscribe to Dave's channel. Uh, link is in the description, so check that out. Um, subscribe to him because he also makes fantastic Lightroom and photo-related content. So definitely check that out. Thanks for watching, and special thanks to Canon. You guys are awesome. They sponsored this video, so you're cool. Thanks, guys. And I forgot to put in a plug for the wonderful Rocky Mountain School of Photography, where I'm teaching this weekend, and again in a month, and again later this summer. And again next year. And again next Hopefully. year. One of, my, one of the best in, in the workshop photography business.